Well, here goes nothing. So, I am Christina, otherwise known as Sunshine Christina. I am a member of the Foul Play Discord YouTube channel and a member of the Making a Murderer research community. I um, have been researching this case for about three years now and recently with the help of other foul play community members um, especially Jax and Susan, Zoe and Darkside I have started a podcast called The Crime Theory Exchange um, on Wednesdays and you can find that on the foul play YouTube channel. Um, I am making this video for a few reasons. One, because I feel like we all need to start making videos talking about this case. Um, yes, it's six years in. Um, yes, I think the majority of the world knows both Brendan and Stephen are intentionally and wrongfully convicted, um, but there still seems to be this small subset who have either been employed or because of an emotional investment to the verdict are bound and determined to try and convince the world that these convictions are accurate and they're not. Um, Teresa Halbach was, he, her murder was used to frame Stephen Avery. Um, I don't know who killed her. All I know is that she was killed after she left the property on Halloween of 2005 and they used it they used her death to frame Stephen and um, when they realized they needed a narrative that um, to help add the evidence into a theory of a crime that the public would believe they added in Brendan and they just stole his life just like they stole Stevens in 85. Um, so there are a few things that I want to talk about. Um, first, let me say I don't even know if I'm going to publish this video. Um, I've never shown my face before and I uh, don't know if I'm going to do that now, but we'll see. Um, anyway, I, uh, thanks to Jeff Jones, another member of the Making a Murderer community, and he also has his own YouTube channel. He was a recipient of the Eric Cose, um, Memorial, uh, Scholarship Fund, and he began a, uh, it's called, a After Dark series on the Jeff Jones MAM channel. It's really good. You should check it out. Um, he gifted me a microphone, so I'm trying that out today. Um, hopefully it'll help with the podcast on Wednesday. And plus if, you know, when I discuss things on the open mic and the, um, Uncle Ken readings that Dr. Silkman does that are just so amazing. Um, so I, uh, began researching this case three years ago. I think I might've already said that. And I've started... I started requesting, um, thanks to Henberry, Seeking Truth, Yoras, J. Jax, Mystic Jinx, and all other FOIA warriors who have shared their vast success and their knowledge. I began writing FOIA requests I don't know, about four or five months ago, and uh, I started requesting the other questionable cases that Manitowoc County has had over the years. There have been a few. Um, the first case, I think, was probably Tom Kasurik's first murder. Um, he was hired um, onto the Manitowoc Police Department in 1969 made a detective I think around 1973 and that's about the time that um, an elderly woman named Mary Glasser was murdered. Um, the Roll brothers, I think it's Marvin and Ronald 
or Randall were arrested for the crime based on the uh, eyewitness testimony of a 13-year-old girl who has since um, repeatedly stated she didn't see what they made her say she saw. Both brothers have maintained their innocence. Um, I think one of them has passed away and uh, I requested that case. I also requested the Deb Sukawati case. Um, that case also has a conviction and that gentleman maintained his innocence until the day he died as well. I also requested the Mary Ziegelbauer case. Mary Ziegelbauer was murdered, I believe in 83, um, when Gregory Allen was living there. Um, for those of you who have a newspapers.com subscription, uh, if you Google, if you uh, do any looking for her in the newspapers archives, you will find that she was a stunning young lady. She was quite beautiful. Um, she didn't live far from where Gregory Allen was living at the time. And they arrested a learning disabled, um, I believe he was 16 year old kid and convicted him of that crime. Um, from what I understand, he maintained his innocence um, the entire time he was in prison as well. Um, interesting note about Mary Ziegelbauer, her brother, Bob Ziegelbauer is the county executive and he has a minimal role in the Stephen Avery saga. Um, how he got the position he holds is interesting and I just found this out. Um, Tom Kosurik wanted to dissolve the county executive board. Um, I think it's a member of like 10 or 12 people and he wanted to just have one county executive. Um, his rationale for that was you would only have to pay one person instead of 12, which sounds good on paper, saves the county money, right? But think about this. If the sheriff and the DA have the county executive in their pocket, they control the town. So that would have been a very huge power play to have both of the town's other powerful men in your pocket. And we know that Kasurik and Vogel have teamed up from the beginning because if you look in the newspaper archives, Vogel and Kasurik, Kasur, Vogel was listed on Kasurik's running ticket um, at, like from day one. So they've always been a tag team. And um, Vogel, I believe, was 25 when he was elected to the, be a DA of Manitowoc County. And that's just, that's appalling to me. Um, what does a 25-year-old kid know about dispensing fair justice? I mean, he's been out of law school, what, a couple of years? How many cases has he actually tried? Um, anyway, the so there's that case. The Ziegelbauer case. Then another case um, I foiled, and I'm still waiting on one more file, is the Randall Matea Pam Claflin murder. That murder took place in '93 um, in Manitowoc County. She actually disappeared from the Manitowoc city limits, it's believed, and her body was found um, in the Manitowoc County city limits. Tom Kasurik was involved in that investigation as well. Randall Matea has, from day one, maintained his innocence. And on paper, there are just a lot of questionable things. There are um, family members whose testimonies changed. There is a, um, they used the fact that they saw him bleaching jeans to uh, a sign of guilt. And we know about the bleach jeans from Brendan. And um, there was a snitch used who had charges dropped against him and also received a cash payout. Um, so, you know, on paper, it just doesn't look good. Um, another rumor that I haven't been able to substantiate is that the Innocence Project was looking into this case and they tried to get the evidence to do DNA testing 
Um, I know that Andrew Colburn, for a fact, went and um, cataloged the evidence at the coroner's office. The rumor is when they, the laboratory got the evidence to test it, either there was nothing to test or no DNA could be found on anything. Um, so I don't know. I'm still looking into the ad, that aspect, but um, if it's true, I do find it odd that, of course, Colburn was attached to that case as well. Um, so hopefully Jax and I will present the Randall, Matea, Pam Clacklin case either on the Crime Theory Exchange or he may even want to do it on an open mic where everyone can join in and we can discuss it, which would be great. Um, what else? Uh, recently, I've been going down the rabbit hole. Um, there was a juvenile court judge by the name of Brett Blame who was arrested for distributing child porn. Um, the images that and videos that he were distributing um, contained adult males engaged in sex acts with toddlers. So this is no laughing matter, no 17 year old girl in a bikini. This is sick shit. Um, he is uh, married and him and his husband have two children. He didn't lose his children. Um, he, there was nine counts total that were brought against him, seven state and two federal. He pled guilty the end of September, I believe, and received a minimum mandatory sentence of five years with the maximum allowed credit for all gain time. So in any way that he could get time off, he's going to get it. I actually think that the plea agree agreement may actually make it where he doesn't have to register as a sex offender. Um, he, uh, his fine was like $5,000 only. He had to surrender his iPhone, poor guy. Um, he, um, he was the, the CFO of his foundation. The name of his foundation was the Cream City Foundation. Now, Jeff Jones um, is a Wisconsin native, and he did explain that there are a, there's a brick manufacturer in Cream City or something. But I'm going to be honest here. I don't think that Brett Blame was thinking about bricks when he named his foundation Cream City. I think he was thinking about something sick because he's a sick individual. Um, he, he also spent his short career prior to becoming a judge because he was elected to be a judge at the age of 38. He spent his short career um, working with disadvantaged youth um, in the public defender's office. And that bothers me because we know that pedophiles tend to work where they have a nice selection to their prey. Um, now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is pure speculation. It's a theory. I have no proof whatsoever. I do have some coincidences and I am looking into it further. There is a court of appeals judge named Paul F. Riley, who on paper cannot be more different than Brett Blame. Brett Blame is gay. He is married to a, a gentleman. He has two children. He is very active in the LGBTQ community. On paper, he's, he doesn't list a religion. He is a liberal. He's also 38, 39 now. I think he might be 40 now. Paul F. Riley is in his mid to late 50s. He is heterosexual. He is married. Him and his wife have a couple of kids. He is a Republican and he is a devout Catholic. Now, for some reason, a couple of weeks after Brett Blame signed his pled guilty and took his plea deal in federal court, Paul F. Riley submitted his resignation in the middle of his term 
and with no explanation. Now, I am sure he is going to land at some cushy firm making, you know, six figures a year. And if we will probably never know why he left. But this is what I find weird. Lame and Riley reside about 25 minutes from each other. Um, he, Josh Call worked the Blame investigation. He, at the same time, was also investigating allegations of abuse in the Catholic Church. He reports that he has his office or his team in this investigation has generated 138 reports. Um, Brett Blame is going to be distributing child porn to those he he knows. So he is in the judiciary circles. He is a um, he's not going to be selling this porn to Uncle Joe in Kentucky. He's going to be distributing it to people he knows. Now I do know that one of the persons he distributed it to was in Minnesota because on the DOJ press release, one of the agencies listed as participating in the investigation is the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. And I do have a FOIA request into them um, to see what they have on the case. Because I have a feeling if I don't dig, if someone doesn't ask, they're never gonna say who he was distributing the porn to. And I'm curious if he wasn't, one of his customers may have been Riley. And because Riley not only denied several of Stephen's appeals prior to Kathleen Zellner coming on board, he also helped pin the laughable denial that the Court of Appeals just authored recently this past summer in 2021 if he had been caught with this child porn, would they bury this because of his connection to the Stephen Avery case? And I have to say, yes, they would. They would hide it um, because they cannot allow this case to get in front of a judge and in front of a camera because once Zellner gets the case in a courtroom and lays it all out there in front of the camera and in front of the world, the, the attempt to pretend like there's nothing wrong will be over because the curtain has been raised and everyone will see it for what it is, right? So, I mean... Do I have any proof that Riley is one of his clients? No, but it's just the timing of all of these things just can't be ignored. So I'm gonna see, I have several requests out looking for information. Um, we'll see what it, what we come up with. I, I hope that maybe someone in the Wisconsin judiciary, if I do decide to publish this video, will see this and is interested in justice and will look into this a little further. I can't do anything from my house. I'm over 1,500 miles away. I don't have the ability to sit in the bars and hang out at the courthouses and listen to the chatter, um, but y'all do. So, you know, put your ear, put your ear out. Put a fly on the wall. See what you can come up with. Because I think there's more to this than, than just um, Evers and Riley being two separate uh, political parties. Because Evers was not prepared for Riley's resignation. He's still, he's still looking for someone to fill the seat on the Court of Appeals. Um, and Riley, from the time he graduated law school, has chose a career path of serving as a judge and that was his goal like you could tell that's what he's always wanted to do 
I think he, uh, you know, he may have aspired to be on the Wisconsin Supreme Court one day. And now it's over, just in the middle of it. It's not like he's in his late 60s and ready to retire. It's, it's just, you know, something is off. And I just feel like it's likely connected to the Blame thing. So, you know, um, if you have any info, please leave a comment. Or look, you know, try and reach me on Twitter or on Reddit. Um, I uh, made a Reddit sub for the Crime Theory Exchange podcast. You can message me there. Um, is there anything else? Oh. Here's another little interesting thing I found out this week. Well, I got the proof this week. So we all know who Joseph Wayne Evans is. Joseph Wayne Evans is the gentleman who, a few months after the debut of Making a Murderer, um, claimed that Stephen Avery had confessed to killing Teresa Halbach to him. And... He wrote like this extravagantly long letter, I think eight or nine pages of uh, filled with all kinds of just odd bits of information um, from the fact that the reason Teresa's vaginal cells will be found on the bullet is because she was shot in the vagina, which, you know, is really odd because um, we all know Stephen didn't kill her. So why would he be talking about that? And we know that the pap smear was used to make the DNA um, DNA test to do the DNA matching. So, you know, did Colhane put vaginal cells on the bullet wash? Um, so, you have to look at it when you know when you know the inmates didn't confess. You have to look at why the snitch is writing the letter, right? So. Um, I'm just wondering what his motivation was. So I did some looking. And if you go on the Wisconsin uh, Department of Corrections website and put in Evan's name and go to the movement sheet, you will see that um, roughly about four weeks after he was convicted of first degree murder and the death of a 40 year old woman in Marionette County, here's yet another coincidence. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and he was sent to Dodge Correctional. Now, a few weeks after he was sentenced to life, and you know, right after he found out that he was never going to leave prison out of a pine box, he is sent from Boscobel, Wisconsin, clear across the state to the Manitowoc County Jail. The official reason is for overcrowding. Now, here's the problem with that. I did some research on the newspapers.com site, seeing if they were actually having overcrowding to the point that they were taking maximum security prisoners, which those are the worst of the worst, and actually putting them in, in jails clear across the state with civilians, many who had not been convicted of a crime, because that seems awful risky. And I couldn't find anything. The only thing I was able to find was that they had restructured the sentencing guidelines for nonviolent offenders to help ease prison overcrowding. And then they were also trying to get about a billion dollars in the next 10 years in taxpayer funding to build more prisons. Um, no mention of taking the worst of the worst and shipping them all over to the jails. Plus, I do think it's likely there were better jails um, closer to Boscobel than clear across the, the county or clear across the state. Then you have the fact that they ship him to the county that Stephen was living when Teresa was murdered. So now you have Marionette, where Stephen has a connection, is where Evans is convicted. Now you have Manitowoc, which is where Stephen allegedly killed Teresa Hallmock, where Evans is hanging out. 
Now he's only there for like five months. They ship him back to Boscobel, back to Dodge Correctional in June. So I guess whatever overcrowding was going on was solved in a few months. Um, and then you don't hear anything about a, you know, a confession. You don't hear anything. You don't hear anything. And then, you know, a few months after making a murderer, he writes this, you know, god-awful, ridiculous letter. Well, from what I understand, he also, because of that snitch letter, got an audience with the Convicting a Murderer documentary. And they spent many, many hours with him interviewing him for their documentary which is supposedly a a documentary aimed at showing the truth because as people want some people want everyone to believe making a murderer left a lot of stuff out and you know Stephen and Brendan are really guilty the cops didn't do anything wrong um and Blah, blah, blah. And convicting is going to prove that. So, I don't know how they think they're going to do it. But we'll see. Um, anyway, so he spent hours with the convicting crew. And then someone, a supporter, provided a $100,000 for Kathleen Zellner's office to offer a reward for tips leading to the... Um, conviction of the actual murder of Teresa Halbach. And I guess Evans is greedy and he saw that and he was like whatever he got from the state of Wisconsin or the prosecutors or whatever he got for writing the Stephen Avery told me he did it letter obviously doesn't compare to a hundred thousand dollars. So he then decided he would confess to being the killer and he framed Stephen. So he did that. So that kind of screwed convicting a murderer up. Um, they had to restructure how they were going to do their documentary, I'm sure. And uh, so I just find it odd that Joseph Wayne Evans was shipped to Manitowoc as a maximum security inmate and um, hung out there for a few months and went back to Dodge Correctional, the same prison they shipped him out of. And uh, he has his little insertion into this frigging roller coaster, just unbelievable case. And, uh, you know, we do know that there was a snitch in the 85 case that um that letter was kept in the sheriff's office until um the wisconsin dci came to collect the documents and peterson gave it to her gave it to strauss um and we know that letter is bogus as well so i don't you know do the da's and cops put these inmates up to them or do they just not care that they're not credible i just makes you wonder so anyway i'm going to get off of here um i haven't decided if i'm gonna post this yet um if i do please hit like and subscribe if you find the content interesting and you want to hear more if you have any questions um drop a comment below and um everybody have a lovely saturday So I know I said that uh, I probably wouldn't do any videos. Um, I recorded one and I, um, against my better judgment, I loaded it, even though I haven't really advertised it to anyone. I think it's important that we try to at least get it out there that, um, Gregory Allen, in my opinion, is the key to everything in the Stephen Avery case. Um, beginning with Stephen's wrongful conviction in 1985 of a crime that Gregory Allen committed to um, the fact that when he was arrested in 1995, 
and for the crime for which he's doing 60 years right now in the Wisconsin prison system, um, Manitowoc County had a chance at that time to, you know, rethink their intentional wrongful incarceration of Stephen Avery, and yet they chose not to until um, 2003 when the Innocence Project was finally successful in getting forensic evidence tested and of course it exonerated Stephen. Um, we all know that from Making a Murderer that the depositions were in the middle of uh, taking place when Teresa Halbach disappeared. And at that time, if you look in, in the media, the the topics of discussion were Gregory Allen, the how did Manitowoc County wrongfully convict this guy. Um, Wisconsin was, you know, restructuring legislation. They even had a bill named after Stephen Avery. Um, I think criminal justice reform in Wisconsin was going to take place. And then out of nowhere, this photographer who visited the Avery property disappears. And lo and behold, all the evidence, all the physical evidence, and even DNA points to Stephen Avery. Now, on the surface, it looks like a slam dunk conviction, but yet, you know, many of us know, once you take a look, peel back that first layer, this case is just like the Penny Bernstein case, full of shit. It is not by any means a rightful conviction. Um, they ended up stealing yet another person's life by using Brendan the way they did to incorporate a narrative of a crime that factually did not occur. And um, if any, you know, all it takes is a, a close, just a quick look. Um, you know, why is the coroner from Calumet County signed in on November 10th the same day he's in the Manitowoc County Quarry, there's no coroner that ever steps foot on the Avery property. The same day Calumet County Coroner Mike Kleiser is in the Manitowoc County owned quarry. At the time he's there, he pronounced Teresa Halbach deceased. Um, we have photos of lots of activity in the Manitowoc County Quarry, yet we have no photos of these alleged bones in the burn pit. All we have are the words of officers that have lied about everything. So it is my position that they didn't even bother bringing the bones to the property. They changed it all on paper, but I digress. Um, this video is to establish what the mood of the government employees of Wisconsin was around October 31st, 2005. Jean Couchet had just been deposed on October 26th. He had had a really bad deposition. Um, you know, Glenn and Kelly had pretty much made it obvious that nobody was believing that he didn't trace Stephen Avery's mugshot. And if he didn't trace it, he most definitely looked at Stephen Avery's photograph and drew it. Um, so technically he may not be lying. Um, he, Jean Crochet did a really weird thing. In 96, he interviewed three Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department detectives about other suspects in the Penny Bernstein assault. Now what's funny is they never mentioned Gregory Allen, yet we all know there's hundreds of criminal filings, criminal police reports on Gregory Allen. One of the detectives interviewed Conrad actually investigated a, a jailhouse informant 
who claimed that Gregory Allen had confessed to a murder in North Carolina, which we know is the murder of Donna Emmel, who he is the main suspect in, that took place in 1975 in Newport, North Carolina. And yet, so, and that took place um, he stopped investigating 12 of 83. That file was copied in March of 85 for the Manitowoc Police Department. So not five months later, when Penny Bernstein is getting assaulted, Conrad had to, I mean, it's ludicrous to think that a, a county as small as Manitowoc is playing ignorant about Gregory Allen. No one believes it. I mean, maybe people who aren't really, really sitting and thinking about how police interact with police and how first responders interact with first responders. But so Couché had been deposed and he was questioned about the interviews in 96. He was, you know, why wasn't Gregory Allen brought up? He played dumb, like he didn't know who Gregory Allen was. We all know everyone in Manitowoc County that worked in in the police and sheriff's department knew who Gregory Allen was. He was like the devil of Manitowoc. Um, he was peeping and prowling and stalking young girls, grown women, breaking into homes, just being a horrific individual. So we established that Jean Couchet, Glenn and Kelly established that Jean Couchet was lying. Manitowoc County knew about Gregory Allen. They also established that the phone call in 96 um, saying that Allen and not Avery was responsible for Penny's assault was common knowledge throughout Manitowoc County law enforcement yet they sat on it and did nothing. They also established that, um, that uh, not only did the sheriff, Kusurik, know about it, so did the undersheriff, Peterson. Um, they established that Stephen Avery's mugshot was kept in June Couchet's office for some odd reason, um, probably like a trophy, you know how people mount deer heads on the wall he was probably really proud you know of frame that's probably his first suspect he ever framed um so manitowoc county was in dire straits and you have to remember that the attorney general's office issued a 15 page report absolving everyone of any wrongdoing in the intentional framing and wrongful incarceration of Stephen Avery. So the AG's office looks just as corrupt as the Sheriff's Department. Um, and then now we find out that in the midst of all this, and this is all being discussed in the newspaper, in the radio, on the nightly news, in the magazines. I mean, everyone is talking about how did Manitowoc do this to Stephen Avery and what is going to happen now? And, you know, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? And who is Gregory Allen and how many women has he assaulted? And then in May, Gregory Allen gets another CODIS hit for yet another violent sexual assault. That was committed in Hennepin County at the time when Stephen Avery was serving Gregory Allen's time for the penny assault. This crime occurred in 1991. So they issued the warrant for Gregory Allen's arrest for this crime in August of 2005. Now, Put that in perspective with the depositions. So at this time, we have, I think, Kalanchik was deposed in August. I think um, Bells was deposed in August. So they're establishing that the, that nothing happened without Kusurik's knowledge. 
um, and Kusurik would know, you know, who, there's no way that Kusurik could not know who Gregory Allen was. And yet another woman is shown to have been violently and viciously assaulted by Gregory Allen because Tom Kusurik chose to get vengeance against some punk ass low IQ kid instead of locking up a violent and prolific assaulter of women. And then here's another thing that really bothers me about Tom Kusur. He and Penny Bernstein were neighbors. Tom Kusurik's wife and Penny Bernstein were friends. They served on church social boards, church charity boards together. They went to church together. I'm sure when their kids were younger, their kids played together. He would watch that woman heal from the vicious and violent beating that Gregory Allen gave her. And he let Gregory Allen stay free to do that to yet another woman. She came to him and said, hey, you know, I'm getting these prank calls. Are we sure we got the right guy? And he said, oh, don't worry about it. We got the right guy. Knowing that he has left this guy out there to do this to other women. And what kind of sadistic, sick mind does that? I mean, I can understand being a cop and being like, nobody messes with a cop's wife. But why wouldn't you take that same thinking and set Gregory Allen up and protect the women in your county and the young girls in your county from him? Why did you let him stay free? to keep raping and assaulting women and children. It makes no sense. You can't use the, I was protecting the public speech when you allowed a man way, way worse than Stephen Avery to stay free to have his way with dozens of women and young girls. So, Kosurik was in a bad spot on Halloween of 2005 and then he finds out that not only is he going to have to answer for all that they already know about but Gregory Allen is linked to yet another assault if he would went to prison Dennis Vogel would have went to prison speaking of Dennis Vogel how do you explain as the elected DA giving Gregory Allen free pass after free pass? He dismissed charges. He gave, he changed criminal charges to municipal violations. He pled him out to probation. He had at minimum three meetings, closed door meetings, him and Gregory Allen while Gregory Allen was under indictment prior to Penny's assault. So when he tries to act like he doesn't know who Allen was, and if you read the DOJ investigation of the 85 case, Vogel tries to play stupid, like he didn't know who Allen was. Of course he knew who he was. He had wrote a letter to two detectives in the Manitowoc Police Department asking them to rethink IDing Allen as a suspect in yet another woman's prowling incident where he is caught trying to break into her home. He's trying to reduce the charges on yet another attack. I mean, they just kept letting this guy stay free. And I don't understand why they protected him. And I feel like when they found out in the midst of the depositions that Gregory Allen had been linked to yet another assault on yet another woman, they panicked. And did they kill Teresa Halbach? I don't know. I know they were desperate to get Stephen Avery as a good guy and Manitowoc County let Gregory Allen 
prolific, violent assaulter of women. They let Gregory Allen, you know, remain free. And how many women has he assaulted? Could you imagine a DNA hit becoming public at that time? It just would have been devastating to any defense. Manitowoc County, Tom Kasurik, and Dennis Vogel had to the we didn't mean to, it was an accident, we didn't know any better, we didn't know who he was, um, we were trying to protect the public. There's no defense for allowing Allen to stay free when you framed Stephen Avery for getting back at his cousin who was spreading ridiculous rumors about him. And then you have the fact that Judy Dvorak forged and fabricated police reports in the Penny Bernstein case. I mean, I, you know, I just, a lot of people think that Stephen would have never have gotten $36 million. Stephen may not have got $36 million, but this lawsuit would have cost the state of Wisconsin millions upon millions of dollars in reform, in Gregory Allen victims coming forward and wanting their their rightfully entitled money from these, these representatives in Manitowoc County allowing Allen to remain free to harm them. Um, just lost jobs, criminal charges, you know. So what did they do? They either take advantage of the most fortuitous and I mean impeccable timing that someone not connected with the lawsuit decided to kill Teresa Hallbach right after or not long after she left Stephen Avery's property or they hired someone to do this and frame Stephen or someone did this and they all framed Stephen and there have been a lot of people or not a lot of people there have been some really good researchers who have who have provided documents that show not only was manitowoc county in the state of wisconsin not well insured in 1985 they weren't um the subsequent insurance policies are underwritten by a group that is actually made up of law enforcement agencies in Wisconsin. So when a when one officer is sued, it affects the bottom line for all of them. Calumet and Manitowoc County are both underwritten by the same company. And the money is like I don't know if you're familiar with insurance policies, but you can purchase one and the money you pay in, you get back. Well, it's kind of like the retirement fund. So this would have affected their, 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 their revenue. So they all, all of these agents, even though they didn't work for Manitowoc County, were financially motivated for this lawsuit to cease and desist. For Stephen Avery to become an evil man and for everyone to forget about Gregory Allen and see and Gregory Allen is the key to all of this you find out why they let Gregory Allen remain free you find out how they buried the fact that Gregory Allen had a CODIS hit and an arrest warrant issued in August of 2005 that wasn't served until December of 2007, four months after Brendan's trial was over. They quietly extradited him from Wisconsin prison to the Hennepin County Jail. They gave him a sweetheart of a deal. He got like 3,000 days time served. He's already done his time for this, the Minnesota assault. And he is He's he, so if he ever gets released in Wisconsin prison, he walks free. And they gave him a sweetheart of a deal and they quietly brought him back. He was only over there for four months. 
Um, and they offered him the plea. He was going to take it to trial because he knew they didn't want it in the media. Because he knew they framed Stephen. He knows it. He knows what they did. But he doesn't care because he got a qu he got a cake deal and he's got a possibility of getting out of prison alive. But yet Stephen Avery, who's innocent, if we don't get him out, we'll die in prison. And that's fucked up on all levels. Anyway, I'm going to go. Everybody have a great night. Um, you know, comments, leave them below. Um, and if anybody wants documents, let me know and I'll put them in the description box. Have a good night. Happy Thanksgiving.